The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, Training Specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Forensic Accounting, Tools for Financial Exploitation Investigations, presented by Jason Olson and Douglas Cash, which are both of E. Bailey Fraud and Forensic Advisory Services. And they're going to be introducing themselves a bit more in just a moment. But before we get started, next slide. I'd like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is the project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration for Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. The APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're, we're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide. The APS TARC works with the National Adult Protective Services Association, NAPSA, to present monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, managers, and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other and about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held this second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would like to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive the registration information. Next slide. And now on to some housekeeping. A handout of today's slides is available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel, and you can download that at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar, and please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and log back in. Next slide. We are planning to have time at the end of the presentation for questions and comments, but you may ask questions of our presenters anytime by typing them into the questions box in your webinar control panel. And we will relay as many as we can to the speakers when we take questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to Huddle and the web, the TARC website, at a later date, along with a copy of the slides, and we will notify registrants via email when it is posted online. And last but not least, everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And don't forget to take the webinar eval survey, which will pop up right after the uh, webinar. Next slide. And now I'd like to hand it over to our esteemed presenters, Jason and Doug. Take it away. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Doug, and I know Jason's there in regards to it. Um, if you go ahead and move forward, please. This is us. We can't see you, but this is a picture of us, and these are actually current photos. Um, I'm the handsome guy at the bottom, so that's who I am. Um, in regards to that. So Jason, why don't you start off? Yeah, you bet, Doug. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. My name is Jason Olson. I'm a partner with Ide Bailey's Fraud and Forensic Advisory Practice. I'm out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I've been providing forensic accounting services for um, financial investigative purposes for close to about 18, 19 years now. So I look forward to uh, talking today and discussing how you can use leverage forensic accounting for exploitation investigations. And uh, I'm Doug Cash. I'm a senior manager with uh, the Fraud Forensic Advisory Service. Jason is a, my boss and also a friend. We've been working together for about the last 15 years. We have a couple of really different backgrounds. Uh, mine is not in accounting. Mine's actually as a uh, law enforcement officer. I spent almost 30 years in police work, working mainly property and white collar crimes, plus a, working a special as a special agent for the state of Arizona and doing money laundering and anti-terrorist financing investigations for a large bank. And now I help Jason and our colleagues to assist um, 
individuals and businesses and groups such as yourselves around the country and depending on where that is to help them with uh, financial exploitation matters or other types of uh, forensic accounting needs. So if you go forward, you'll get a little bit of a uh, background here real quick on th the firm. We're just gonna let you know that we're not a, a small firm. Uh, I Bailey's in the top 25 of CPA firms in the country. We were established in uh, 1917 and we are housed in uh, Fargo, North Dakota as our headquarters. And as you can see that uh, we have about 350 partners or more and we're in about uh, 44 offices in 14 states, all west of the west of Mississippi. When I joined the firm in uh, 2007, the, one of the first things that uh, I was told that if you want to see small town America and get to know people, that uh, this is a place to be. And I can tell you that that has transpired. Our forensic accounting services relate basically around financial exploitations, economic damage calculations, which has to do with lost profits and things like that. And obviously our website's there in case that you want to see some additional information in regards to the firm itself, uh, in regards to that. The next slide will show you a disclaimer. Obviously anything that uh, we say is, uh, is put together by uh, Jason and I, it's not intended to make you a forensic accountant and it's not uh, you know, designed to give you in-depth knowledge of any of the subject. What it is designed to do is give you a working knowledge of what forensic accounting does. We're going to talk about the profession and what forensic accountants can do for you and what we have seen forensic accountants do in regards to specifically financial exploitation matters and assisting to uh, bring people to their accountability or however you wish to put it. Uh, Jason and I both have a really strong feeling. We wanna hold people accountable for things that they've done wrong and to make sure that they're only accountable for the things that they have uh, done wrong in regards to that. Our agenda slide, next, will tell you kind of the what we're gonna go through real quick. Obviously the background of us, we're gonna talk about what is forensic accounting and there's that term forensic that gets a lot of people confused of what we do. Uh, for many years, Jason and I have joked that uh, we can't recall the number of times that we've been asked, uh, oh, so you look after dead people's money because of thinking of CSI and things like that. And, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, forensic basically is a fancy word for saying it's uh, deemable for court, which means that Jason and I and many other forensic accountants have been identified as expert witnesses in many different courts around the country in regards to being able to testify on behalf of our clients, which means we become the voice of what we see and to be able to provide that. Uh, you'll see that we're gonna talk about the investigative process and how we work through it. We're gonna give a, a real quick case example and give you some takeaways. And hopefully the information that we provide in here will allow you to jumpstart conversations in your organizations on how you might be able to use forensic accountants in the profession to be able to interact with your clients and prosecutors and whoever else you need to, to be able to, to uh, explain financial information. Uh, I, we strongly believe that the best way to understand this is to be able to explain things simply in a format that is easy to understand and that you can explain to people and be able to identify those kind of things. So Jason, why don't you take the polling questions? Yeah, you got it. We can get to the next slide, please. So the first polling question, uh, you can use your questions box uh, to answer this question, but as we wanted to know, what is the number one thing you want to learn from this session? If you could take some time and, and uh, put in your, your response, that'd be great. Looks like folks are being a little shy. Should we go to question two and folks can you catch up? It. Yeah. Absolutely. Question two, again, using your question box. Um, what do you believe is your biggest hurdle when performing a financial exploitation investigation? I have some thoughts on what that might be, but uh, certainly would love to hear from all of you. 
All right, so to the first question, it looks like we have some um, answers that came in. I'd like to learn techniques to identify red flags, tools for APS investigators to use to investigate, uh, able to better identify when dealing with exploitation cases, how to utilize a forensic accountant. Um, let's see, the amount of information that must be gathered. Great. Well, the, the, these are uh, these are great responses because I think we can touch on a lot of those today. Um, you know, our in an hour we can, probably can't get into the weeds too much, but we can absolutely I think cover some of those questions. So that's great. Right. And then then question number two, biggest hurdle looks like obtaining records from financial institutions, clients denial, following the trail, understanding mm -hmm. the financial documentation and what they mean. Yeah. Yeah, that, those are those are all really great responses and pretty pretty common themes, I guess, that uh, that Doug and I hear as as we work with APS throughout the country. Uh, they share some of those same concerns or or items of of interest when when we talk about forensic accounting, how we can leverage that to assist with some of these hurdles. So uh, I really appreciate the responses. Then we'll move next to uh, point question number three. Right. Hey. And I'm going to launch that poll. I have launched the poll. All right. Have you ever engaged in a engaged with a forensic accountant? Go ahead and give you a few more seconds to answer. All right. And as we're, uh, as we're waiting for the responses there, um, when I think about working with a forensic accountant, you know, there's there's various levels of, of, of assistance forensic accounts can provide to APS. It could be as simple as just consulting on the front end, talking about what the allegations look like and what information may be needed to refute or support those allegations, uh, down to drawing up, you know, work papers based on the financial records and providing certain schedules. To, uh, to a more complete uh, work product where it'd be a written report inclusive of a narrative and uh, the work papers and schedules to support the conclusions. And so I think if you have worked with a forensic account, you, you, there's varying, varying levels depending upon the complexity of the matter and the resources your organization may have uh, may dictate how you leverage a forensic account. And it looks like, if I see the results here, it looks like 82% have not worked with a forensic account yet or at least they don't want to admit to working with an account. I, sometimes I know that my, <laughs> you may not want to admit working with an account, but no. Uh, okay, 18% have, so that's great. Um, so hopefully today uh, we can shed a little awareness and enlighten everyone as to what forensic accounting is and how it can be leveraged and answer some of the other questions that uh, all of you raised or brought up. Well, that's great, Jason. And, and actually one of the things that I noticed in one of the questions in there is that um, one of the big hurdles for several people is gaining um, financial records. They're uh, not to my knowledge, and I don't think, I think Jason would agree to me, uh, forensic accountants, no matter where you work, we don't have a magic wand to be able to obtain documentation for us. We're only as good as the documentation that we can be provided with uh, I lost um, my magic, if you will, when they uh, when I retired, that I no longer have access to requesting search warrants or subpoenas. Uh, that's where you know we hopefully provide, an, provide enough information for whoever the investigator is to be able to obtain court orders or subpoenas to be able to obtain those documents. So we're not going to be able to give you any specific answer in regards to how to obtain those uh, documents in regards to that. But, but the one thing to add to that, Doug, is we will be able to touch on, um, you know, how you identify the records you need, right? Um, Correct. And also, and also, you know, get some context around how the requests might look, or what they should maybe consider or look like when you're requesting records from institutions or other third parties. Very true. Well, when we actually talk about a forensic accountant, um, we're Jason and I both belong to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. 
It's the uh, largest fraud investigative group in the world, if you will. It's an international group. There's chapters all over the place. And basically, they define it as an attempt to piece together or reconstruct a past or event or events using financial information where that reconstruction is likely to be used in some judicial proceedings. So basically, what you have to think about as a forensic accountant, they determine or I should say they help you understand as an investigator um, where the money came from and where it was spent and how it was done. You know, in our experience, Jason and I have both understood is that cash really doesn't disappear. It just really changes forms into something else in regards to that. And one of the biggest difference between people so they understand is that forensic accountants are investigative accountants. We're the ones that to try to understand what goes into uh, the activity, where it came from, what happened. We're not financial accountants that decide whether it is um, booked correctly into accounting systems and are given the right deductions and things like that. There are forensic accountants that have that ability in regards to that, it is part of their practice. So depending on what your specific agency is looking for, that's what you, you know, some of the questions you might wanna be able to, to speak with them in regards to it. In our next slide, you'll notice that we're kind of talking about how forensic accountants and exploitation ex investigators can work together, right? Well, for our practice, and I'm sure like many of others, we uh, are able to help either in fraud detection investigation. So did it take place? If it's so, how did it take place? Financial exploitation, obviously, to be able to show that a client, a victim, a vulnerable adult, however you wish to look at them, is uh, taken advantage of what money was used for. Uh, you know, maybe you have a client that's 80 years old and, and uh, unable to uh, to drive or is basically wheelchair bound, but their their money was used to buy a Harley Davidson, which Jason and I have seen. That may not necessarily be for the benefit of the client. To be able to do that obviously litigation support in regards to that and in the economic damage work when someone or calculations where someone's injured and their potential of making money is taken away to be able to do that many forensic accountants including ourselves have worked with many different agencies sheriff's office prosecutors county attorneys uh even sometimes the the, uh, the fbi and other um parts like that, FDIC, some of these places that need an outside view of things, obviously adult you know, protective services, and many times local law enforcement on many different matters, including financial exploitation, potential embezzlement matters, and, and those kind of things. So it depends on your location and the type of expertise that you can find there. You may be able to find all the expertise that you need locally, if not, there are forensic accountants all over that can assist you and including ourselves to be able to help you in regards to that. Next slide. So when we get involved, many times our services are requested because there's um, a limited time that you need to get something done. It's amazing how many times it's staffing issues, everybody is overworked. And I'm sure none of you just have one matter on your plate that you're working on one time, but another, you know, you probably have, I'm gonna say at least two or three that you're working on it at, at, uh, at the same time. And some of those are more, um, you know, simple and others are very complex. And, and when you get into the big complex ones that have numerous financial accounts and you have numerous uh, bank accounts and money's being transferred between those, and you need help to explain those in regards to that, where forensic accountants have uh, the staff and many times um, artificial intelligence or software, whatever you wish to call it, some type of work that we're able to use to streamline that process. And later on, we're gonna talk about that in regards to how that process works, how it streamlines it, and that allows forensic accountants, including us, to be able to produce information back to you in a readable form very quickly in regards to what transpired. Um, I can tell you that when I was a detective, uh, I wish I'd had people like Jason that I could call on to assist me because uh, I back then I was using 
I was using Excel, but I had no idea how to make pivot tables and charts and all this kind of stuff because it wasn't something they taught you in the police academy in regards to do that. So I'm so glad now that we are in a position to be able to help folks like yourselves and others with that because as the old saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. When you can put something up on a chart and it shows very quickly what's going on, it's easy to explain. You know, hiring a forensic accountant is really not that difficult. Basically, you just reach out and, and ask them. And in regards to information, many many accountants, include us, uh, you know, will be more than glad to have a consultation with you and discuss your needs and to be able to assist you with just discussing it. Do you think you know you need to hire someone if you do? If you do, you know, you can always do things such as what we do. You can enter into contracts with uh, states, counties in regards to like a yearly process where you're under contract for a year and they send you cases and, and you have deadlines to get them back. Or potentially it is, for instance, like Jason and I both have worked with counties in regards to a case by case decision that they don't need you all the time, but they want to have you such as a uh, trusted vendor, if you will, that allows you to be able to come in and assist them on a case by case needs. So there are some things like in the next slide that that as a forensic accountant, any forensic accountant that you deal with, including us, right, are going to need information from you. And part of that information is in regards to access to some medical records and the timeline. And the reason that is, is that we don't have access to the vulnerable though, like most of you folks will. So we need to understand when they were diagnosed or started having in co uh, cognitive impairment issues and when their spending habits and things may have been affected by that to determine when their spending patterns happen and to be able to do that. Believe it or not, we all have patterns and to be able to identify when those change, those are kind of those, some of those red flags, if you will, in regards to, um, understanding when did it happen and when did it start to be able to find out what happened. And that's kind of what a forensic accountant will help you do is decide, okay, well, this is kind of when it started and from here is how it's progressed. So in the next slide, you'll notice that some of the things that we need to think about while we're writing our report and while we're reviewing the information to be able to, to show that. You know, obviously the competency in the in the individual. Are they competent to, to make their own decisions? You know, for instance, like was the 80 year old actually competent to make that decision to buy a, a Harley Davidson for a family member or were they not? What's their capacity to sign checks, to get to the bank, to be able to do some of that information? What kind of consent was granted to the people helping them, their caregivers? Was any consent given? If not, why is some of this taking place? Obviously, one of the big ones that we that people talk about all the time, and depending on your laws and your jurisdiction in your uh, in your areas, you know, undue influence is one of those things that is up to interpretation in regards to that. But we need to understand all of these uh, factors that are affecting the case, because we have to look at that to be able to then determine what's the best course of action for us. So we need to be able to identify that to be able to pull information out to match what you folks are looking for and to be able to show these situations. Next slide. So as we talked about, you know, um, you know, does the victim have the capacity did they consent to it? Were they forced to it? Did they were they afraid the people wouldn't come back and visit them if they didn't do that? You know, were they impaired by by medication or physical um, deterioration? How were they infected? Right. But obviously, your prosecutors on your in your court system are going to have a much better understanding of these terms and to be able to have that that discussion. If you are not, we strongly suggest that you have ongoing conversations with your local prosecutors in regards to the people that review, review the cases and charge them. And especially if you're having some uh, 
concerns in regards to, well, why wasn't this filed? And those kind of uh, questions, you need to sit down because it is a learning curve for a lot of prosecutors, especially new ones, into what is it that you folks actually do? What actually is financial exploitation? And that once you build that working relationship, to be able to call them up and say, hey, can I bounce something off of you or ask you a question, you know, kind of off the record or hypothetical or however you want to put it, building that relationships allows you to build a case even better because you're able to provide them with the information they need to move forward. Next slide. So when we talk about authority, right, obviously powers of attorney, and I, I doubt there's many of us that haven't seen issues with power of attorney. Someone has made it up, they falsified them, they've begun, they've been you know, going above the scope, however you want to do it. Obviously, guardianships and conservatorships, are they actually working in the benefit of the client, the vulnerable adult? And to be able to understand how those work. So as a forensic accountant, if these documents exist, that's part of the documentation we need to see to be able to see, for instance, the power of attorney. What power was granted to this person? What were they supposed to do? And did they actually follow it? The same thing in guardianship and conservatorships. You know, this is what they were told they could do, but what did they else did they do? And depending on where you're at, there are many other laws, fraction and fractions, however you want to put it that may not necessarily be called financial exploitation, but they can be charged because somebody does something they weren't supposed to. Larceny, theft, embezzlement, forgery, you know, all of those also can be filed. And, and depending on where you're at, the statute of limitations sometimes is really amazing on those. Uh, for instance, here in Colorado, where I'm at, Forgery, the crime of forgery, does not have a statute of limitations, which means that no matter when a forgery took place in regards to that, if you can show that it took place at any time, they can file charges for that. Now, that's not necessarily true in other states. When I worked in Arizona, there was a seven-year statute of limitations on forgery, but here it's not. So depending on the laws and stuff that you're on. So you need to understand the laws also, and that's where your conversations come in with your investigators in, in regards to that. Excellent. Hey, Doug, I think I'll yeah, add okay. to that. Um, you know, you brought up a good point of, of, of working with prosecutors, law enforcement uh, on the front end, if possible. And it really is helpful from the, from the engagements I've been involved with as a forensic accountant working with prosecutors, law enforcement, and APS before, even before anyone starts digging through the financial records in any great detail, understanding, uh, you know, the, the mental health aspect of the client, understanding what the prosecutor may be looking for from a charging perspective. And then also as a forensic accountant, identifying what records are currently available, what are other records may we need to be thinking of considering. From a timeline perspective, as Doug mentioned, knowing when uh, their mental health may have changed, knowing when uh, the, the person of interest uh, develops some sort of relationship with the client. Uh, all of that is helpful because that helps us understand, okay, you know, typically we'd wanna see a year worth of records, six months to a year's worth of records before uh, the, the, the beginning date of that uh, relationship between the person of interest and the client. And then, you know, throughout the time period and after, if you can, so we can see a before and after comparison of transactions to look for changes in spending habits. Uh, and that all of that is really helpful, especially from a forensic accountant perspective, because we're certainly not medical health experts, we're certainly not attorneys or, or law enforcement to some extent, uh, but it's helpful to be in the same room with APS, prosecutors, law enforcement, to be talking through what needs to be done to refute or support exploitation uh, allegations. Good points, Jason. I appreciate you adding that on there. Um, the one thing we both agree on is sometimes you don't really have a smoking gun in regards to what transpired. And that's why you have to rely on the totality of what's happening. It is the pattern, if you will. Uh, it Look at it as a puzzle that you really don't understand what transpired 
until you get the entire puzzle put together. And once you get all those sections put together, then you'll understand the whole bit of it. And that's much easier sometimes to, to explain and to show this is what's happening, even though you don't have that smoking gun, if you will, in regards to what happened. So remember, you don't have to have just one piece of information that proves it. Take everything into account that's put together and build your case from there to be able to do that. In our next slide, we'll talk, we'll show kind of how the investigative process works for uh, the forensic accountants we know and for us, obviously. And as Jason was mentioned, identifying assets. Uh, your forensic accounting accountant can help you identify where can you look for assets? How might you, might you find them? What records should you request to be able to show that in regards to that? Uh, obviously, then you obtain those and inventory those. I, I don't recall the last time, Jason may have one, but I don't recall the last time that I got a, uh, an examination from anyone that there wasn't maybe a page or two missing out of a bank statement that just didn't get scanned right or something like that. And it's very easy to miss when you're doing it when you have a bunch of other things going on. Well, one of the first things that a forensic accountant is going to do is going to inventory all those records to make sure that they are there and that there's not information missing from those that because that well that one transaction that you're looking for might be on that one page that's missing that you'll be able to get that so you get the that information you then you uh you examine the financial records you look at what it says and then you document your findings in regards to that and you provide those findings in into the next so and when we start talking about identifying slides, let's get into the next slide where it says that how do you know gathering evidence? What do they own? And a lot of times, you know, older folks, they don't necessarily always trust banks because they've grown up, especially some of the ones that grew up close to the depression or during uh, you know, the, the strict times in World War II and, and Korea and those. So they may have a different idea of what their assets are or how they are going to uh, secure them right so when we start talking about assets you know real estate you can start looking at county tax records closing documents property deeds which all of that is public record obviously financial accounts bank bank accounts investment accounts retirement accounts any account that you can think of in regards to where money came from or how it was spent. Maybe it's a line of credit, maybe it is a, a Bitcoin uh, a purse or wallet or whatever they're called. We have a, one of our colleagues is, is, helps out with that and he, he knows all those fancy terms in regards to it. You know, loan applications, financial statements, many times in, in loan applications that the vulnerable adult is used on, maybe the, 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 the perpetrator, if you will, filled out a loan. It's amazing how truthful many people are on loan applications when they're trying to get you know, get loan for a car or a truck or something else, that they actually list things that people don't know about. Tax returns obviously shows how much money was actually um, reported to the government in regards to it. That comes in useful for us to see, well, when we're going through the information, this is how much uh, legitimate income there appears to come into these folks' account. And then we can also see in their tax return, it was actually claimed, so there's not any issue. One of the big things in my experience, credit reports, it's amazing the information that you can get off of there. It will show instances where maybe accounts were opened in somebody's name they weren't aware of, they're a co-signer, but it'll show inquiries, it'll show all this information that may give you an idea in regards to that. In the next slide, we also want people to remember that there could be safety deposit boxes that are being paid for in regards to by a credit card or a withdrawal from a bank where they're keeping special papers and they may have forgotten about it, but it's still, it's a, a fee that's coming out of their bank statements every month that you're not sure exactly what that is. Obviously, insurance policies are their distributions and things coming from that. Who's the beneficiary? Uh, previous employers, HR documentation about relatives and things, items at home. And if you can, you know, walk around in the home and talk to people, cash, collectibles, jewelries, 
vehicles, memorabilia. Maybe they have bought, you know, paintings or something else that's worth a lot of money that they haven't said anything to. They've invested their money. Even with older adults, you have to remember regarding their computers. It may not necessarily be them on the computer. It could be a family member or it could be the perpetrator on that uh, computer doing searches or doing accounting or logging into accounts and doing that kind of information to be able to keep track of what they're doing. So you need to look at some of the files here, file extensions. And I, I can tell you that Jason is one of the folks in our firm that, that works a lot with this area in regards to these computers and getting it obtained. And we're lucky enough at I Bailey, we have our own computer forensic people that we're able to do this for, so we don't have to outsource that. Everything stays in house. Jason, is there anything you want to add about the computers? Yeah, just a few things. Um, yeah, I think this is something that we need to be mindful of uh, presently and going forward, right? As as we have individuals that become, uh, well, as they age and uh, and they, they fall into the category of being a client of APS, um, it's as if they've used any the mobile or electronic devices to monitor their banking or credit card activity, possibly downloading files. Uh, you know, they may be, they, those files, at, from whatever point in time may be present on those computers. And so typically what can be done is you can quickly run a, a uh, report that would generate all the files, relevant files that would be existence on the computer. And you can start to identify what might be relevant to any sort of financial accounts. Again, with the idea of just trying to explore where there might be other assets, right? Um, and, so, and so I think it's just something to be mindful of uh, going forward and certainly uh, a variety of law enforcement agencies around the country have access to computer forensics, so it might be working with law enforcement uh, to have them assist you with uh, computer forensics. And the other thing I'll just briefly mention here as well, on the previous employer piece, um, you know, most organizations require that you give them your routing and bank account information to for direct deposit purposes and that kind of thing. And so. Just be mindful of where where clients that have previously worked may help identify other accounts, uh, and possibly for for law enforcement purposes with with uh, persons of interest. Uh, so again, just just leveraging some of these other third party areas or other records that may exist that maybe you may not be using today to identify assets, but should be considering for tomorrow. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate that. Uh, next slide. So when you start obtaining documents, especially if you're going to be using a forensic accountant, uh, you know, there's certain things that you want to make sure that you that you get hold of, right? You want to get hold of the, um, obviously, the uh, power of attorneys, signature, ca uh, signature cards, wills and trusts. You want to be able to verify the names. That's where the signature ca cards come in. This also helps in regards to forgeries in regards to whether it was uh, signed improperly or not for you know the person and to be able to look at that. There's not many forensic accountants that are also document examiners that can tell you that it actually is a forgery. Uh, many times they can just tell you that it appears to be different and suggest that you actually get a handwriting expert document examiner to look at that to be able to uh, determine whether it actually is real or not. As we all know, our signatures change. As you get older, it could change from day to day. And just because it doesn't seem similar, it could be the same person. It just depends on their ability that day in regards to that. The one thing we wanna make sure that a lot of you, and I'm sure the vast majority of you do, but if you do and you're interviewing your vulnerable adult witnesses and perpetrators, if you, if you do, please preserve that information in that interview, um, either in writing or audio tape or videotape, depending on where you can, if you can, in regards to that. And many uh, times a forensic accountant, especially ones that are also professional interviewers like Jason and I are, that we can help you uh, determine questions to ask or how to interact with these folks, different people, need to be uh, spoken to differently and the questions you need to formulate and possibly help you. So also lean on your forensic accountant uh, to help you design some of the questions that you might need for your interviews 
and to be able to do that. And, and obviously, if you have a transcript of an interview, if you can provide that as part of the casework to be reviewed by your forensic accountant is very helpful. So next slide. So when you start obtaining these records, we strongly suggest that if at all possible, you obtain them electronically. It allows for easier storage. It also allows for easier use in computers and to be able to run those through software to sort them, identify them, and to be able to those kind of things. So many of those can be scanned and then exported into a database. A lot of times banking transactions, we can get it ran right into uh, Excel, right? Uh, when you scan them, you always want to make sure the pages are straight and it's legible. Uh, Jason and I have both seen many times that we get scanned documents that are, uh, they've got redacted information on it, you can't read and things like that. And we understand sometimes that that is, is necessary for privacy in regards to that. But if at all possible, get that information in PDF form so you can look at it and to go through that. So when you start inventorying and doing this, you want to separate the information out. And one of the things that any forensic accountant is going to ask you is that when you provide information to them, is that you provide it and it's separated out into accounts, uh, bank names, those kind of things so that we can group them. Please don't send your forensic accountant uh, a, a zip file that's got four or 500 documents in it that are just numbered one through 500, and they have to go through and then figure out what document is what, literally many times rename them and then inventory them to be able to do that, to be able to run them. So it helps out with time in regards to getting that information back. And believe it or not, if you do that for yourselves, then it will actually make your investigative process is um, in a better, better sense. And then, you know, decide on which date of order you wanna sep uh, separate these in. You wanna be able, you know, maybe you wanna go oldest to newest or newest to oldest, depending on, on how you do it. Each case may be a little different and with, uh, Excel and many formats, you're able with a click of a button to resort it one way or the other and pull information out. So it's very easy to look at in regards to that. On the next slide, you'll see a copy of a bank statement. And I wanna kind of explain a couple of things in reference to this. This is a Wells Fargo statement, but a lot of people sometimes misunderstand what is a transaction? A transaction on a bank statement, an invoice, any of that kind of information is basically a line item. As you can see here at the bottom of this page, it's just a sample, but you'll notice that there are at least, there's three different line items on there. That means that on this page alone, there's at least three transactions, which means every one of those transactions need to be looked at separately and separated out to be able to figure out whether it was for the benefit of the client or not. They can't be jumbled out. So when you start trying to determine, you know, how long this is going to take, start thinking about the number of transactions that you have. And when you start getting up in the thousands of, you know, transactions, then you got to start looking at, you know, software and assistance to be able to do it much faster. Because uh, I would, don't imagine many of you are accountants or used to using a 10 key and putting information into a spreadsheet. So just realize is that, people that are used to that can do it much faster, even if it has to be done um, manually. Also in regards to the documents, forensic accountants are gonna ask you to try to get them the most pristine copies that you they can, because if they're written on, which many of us do, we write on it, we'll check mark, we'll highlight as we're going through our accounting and stuff like that, but many of the softwares out there can't read through that information. So we suggest that you attempt, if at all possible, to get this information directly from the source. Uh, for instance, this would be Wells Fargo. Get a direct download from Wells Fargo. They will come to you pristine. There's no markings on them, there's nothing. 
and that allows software, no matter who does it, to be able to read it much faster and cleaner for you, because the cleaner it can read it, the less cleanup has to be done manually, which increases the turnaround time, and we're a, you know, able to get it out next. In the next slide, you'll see that we're talking about a, um, a, a obviously a check. When you're looking at a check, you, you understand that there are certain parts of it, obviously who has paid order to, the date, and things. The bottom of the check sometimes is a little bit of a mystery, and they're really not uh, once you understand them, because the routing number is the bank, right? Where it came from, the account number is there, and sometimes people alter checks, sometimes they counterfeit checks. There are, is software out there that people can counterfeit a check against a vulnerable adult's account. We've seen that happen. And then obviously the check number. And if it, you know, to make sure all of those look at it, so then it's amazing how many people put something in the memo line on what it's being used for. It's being used for a loan or a gift or something like that along those lines. So then you'll have that information that you can then say, okay, does that match back to their authority to do so? And if it says a gift, did the vulnerable adult actually have the, the capability and the understanding to actually give that gift? So that can be a powerful tool to understand how that money was, was done. On the next slide, you'll see the back of a check. And many times you you'll get an account and you're not gonna have this back of, the, back of a, a, a check. Uh, Jason and I can't emphasize enough how important this is for either a forensic accountant or for you doing independent investigations. Because on the back of the check, it's going to tell you exactly where that money went and exactly where that uh, check was deposited into. And it may have gone someplace that doesn't match what's on the front of the check. Or for instance, on the back, it may... Um, have for uh, not used for intended purposes, and it may have another name, or it could have just deposit only and going to a different account. So when you order checks, if you're not getting the back, we strongly suggest you always ask for the front and back copies of the checks so you can see those. And I can tell you in our experience, and I'm sure Jason would agree, we have found situations where that has helped us locate um, hidden or unknown accounts or however you want to put it by understanding that the folks sent money where that wasn't supposed to. So on the next slide, this is, as we've all seen, this is a deposit slip. This is how you get money into the bank. Well, the other aspect of this is also these can be altered. As you can see, the bank routing number and the bank account at the bottom, that's where this deposit slip is designed for, and it's got the totals on the side. Well, unfortunately, that will just give you a total amount of information. What you need is identified, for instance, in the next slide, is what's called the deposit item detail. So when you request deposit tickets, you must also make sure you request the deposit item detail. And what this does is identify where that money's coming from. For instance, you may have a perpetrator that says, hey, I paid back $1,500 to them for whatever money they have, and I wrote them a check, and I gave it to them, and they deposited it. So you go back, and you pull the deposits, and you can go back and find out exactly if there is a $1,500 check. If so, who's it made payable to and who it's from and where it came from? And they could be moving money, for instance, from one account to another, and then repaying it because they don't want the uh, vulnerable adults money to be their accounts to overdraw or whatever. So they're, they're stealing money, but then they're replacing it. So it might show you where that account is. And the next slide, obviously you want to talk about tax returns. A lot of times this, uh, you know, this is the old time where people were able to uh, itemize things, but these forms will give you, especially like the, the schedule B, as you can see here, it will give you interest dividends, um, ordinary dividends. This is investment money that's coming back to the individual and can help it identify those uh, accounts and the amount of money that's showing up. In the next slide, you'll also show a capital gains and losses. Next slide. 
So this will show you if they made money or they didn't make money. And if they made money, where it came from. And if they made money, can you show that that money that was made actually went into the account it was supposed to in regards to this? And sometimes we're asked in regards to, well, I can't, you know, how do I get hold of tax returns? They don't have them. On the next slide, there's actually a form that can be filled out. It's called a 4506T. You can actually get this filled out by your vulnerable adult, adult and sign and request transcripts of their tax returns. Uh, the IRS is uh, like a black hole. They don't lose anything. It may take them a while to get it to you, but if you need tax returns, all you need to do is ask for it through this form and they will be able to, to be able to get those. In the next slide, one thing we wanna make sure you also understand is you know being able to help them get their annual credit report. And you're, we're all legally allowed to get a credit report each year. And we strongly suggest that that people do that no matter their age to be able to keep track of their accounts and make sure there's nothing bad there. And this will give you all kinds of information in regards to that. So once you get all this information, you know, uh, next slide, we start examining the, print, the examining the bank statements. Obviously, the statements, the cancel checks, the deposit tickets we've talked about. What do you do? You've got those. So now what you look for? You're going to look for patterns of unusual spending by this individual. Has all of a sudden has their taste in food changed? Have all of a sudden have expenses at very expensive restaurants started showing up in regards to that? And when did that happen? Obviously, we talked about forgeries. Are the signatures valid or not? Right? Do purchases make, do they make sense or not? You know, why is the an individual in a wheelchair buying a, a a, a you know sixty thousand dollar Harley, as we spoke about checks to cash. That's that'll show you who endorsed the back of it. That will tell you basically who got the cash. Many financial institutions require you to go in, and actually some people still do. They'll write a check, go to the bank, and they'll make it out to cash, and they'll they basically cash a check to themselves in regards to that. So then, when you have this information, you want to compare and contrast the spending before the allegations and after the allegations. Uh, Jason and I helped out on a trust matter a few years ago where a, uh, a family member was concerned about their daughter who was a vulnerable adult and friends that were taking advantage of their and we were asked to go in and determine what the spending was before these individuals came into their into the daughter's life compare it to after and they used that information we were able to identify to be able to continue hold of the um, trust to be able to do that in regards to this. Uh, so do those, right? Obviously we're looking for unknown accounts, or unknown uh, activity. One of the things that it's kind of outside financial exploitation, but one of the things that showed up in one of my exams was a credit card transaction. One of them that identified a storage unit in another state that they normally paid in cash, but they only they ran out of cash one day and paid it with a credit card. And there was a bunch of, of valuable items found hidden inside that, inside that uh, storage room that were very valuable. Obviously withdrawals and ATM withdrawals, there are two difference. Withdrawals are normally personally inside the bank where you go in and say, I'd like to withdraw money from my account. They show it up as a withdrawal. And obviously then you have ATM withdrawals. Now, one of the things you remember about ATM withdrawals, there are cameras in those. So if somebody's saying they didn't take that inf that money out through the ATM, you can always request pictures of the people conducting the transaction at that time. That may be necessary through your law enforcement contacts or your court contacts in regards to that in reference to your uh, jurisdiction. But sometimes banks, maybe if you explain it to them, and they have a you know a security department, maybe they'll just be able to, to help that. On the next slide, we, we show in regards to loan documentation. What are you looking for? You're looking for detailed loan statements, documenting the loan disbursements and how it made payments. Someone took out a loan, they got cash back. A lot of folks, elder folks and vulnerable adults, they have their homes, they've owned them for a long time. They have a huge amount of uh, equity in their home and they might, 
be taken advantage of by someone taking out a loan or convincing them to take out a loan and cash out part of that equity. Where did that equity go to? Now, if it went to them for maintenance of their home or they needed some improvements or something else, that is great. But if it didn't, where did it go? And what happened to it, right? Obviously, you wanna talk about some of the source documentation related to that loan disbursement. Can you actually get a copy of the wire information? Uh, that takes me back. I just remember this in regards to bank statements. If you are seeing wire transfers in a bank statement, you can, when you request documents from the bank, you can also ask for the wire transfer information. That will give you all the information on that wire on where it came from or where it went to. The originating bank it came from and where, you know, obviously the bank it went to or vice versa, where it came from from the vulnerable adults account, where it went to. So we'll actually give you that banking information on the wires, but you have to ask for that memo. It's called a memo documentation for wires. You have to ask for that. That's not something they normally just provide. You have to do that. So hey, when uh, you're also, yeah, go ahead, Jason. I'll probably hit the highlights here as we're getting near the end of our uh, time here today, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, as we kind of wrap up our webinar here for today. Uh, looks like we have about three minutes left. Um, oh, I talk long. Sorry. So, so <laughs> no problems. And so, on the loan side of things, it's getting the complete loan file. Understand the purpose of the loan, where the phones, uh, what they were for, how they were used, and see if that marries up with what the intended purpose was. Next slide. Credit card statements, very similar to bank statements, right? We want to see the monthly statements. Look for unusual patterns of spending as it relates to the client. Uh, oftentimes you see a difference uh, when when a person of interest ent enters their life and you start seeing uh, uncharacteristic spending, right? The other thing we look for too is how are payments being made? What are the sources of those payments? Do they reconcile back to the bank statements we have? If they do not, that might identify another account that we need to look into. Next slide. Uh, compare and contrast between our clients and the person of interest financial accounts. It's really, uh, uh, compare contrast to identify what what do we see in the client's count versus what we don't see in the client's count compared to the person of interest. If we don't see any living expenditures in the person of interest accounts, but we see a significant amount, a significant amount of living expenditures in the client's account, then that may cause us to be a little more curious as to whether or not that client's funds are being used to support all of the living or majority of living expenditures of the persons of interest. So again, we're doing compare contrast between the client and the person of interest. Next slide. Uh, documenting findings, you know, Doug mentioned early on about a picture's worth a thousand words. And really that's that's the, really the, the key role of a forensic account. We're fact finders. We're using financial transactions to tell a story. And one of the best ways for us to do that is to take spreadsheets of documents and transactions and break it out into something simplistic for the everyday individual to understand. And so we leverage technologies like Excel and pivot tables uh, and other softwares to tell that story. Next slide. Uh, oftentimes, like I mentioned earlier, there might be a narrative or a written report, work papers, and then actual the, the financial records that support the findings within those work papers. Next slide. And again, on our end, the more we know about uh, the vulnerable adult or the client, their age, health, mental capacity, and in those type of pieces of information that we can tie that into what the financial transactions record shows us. Next slide. So the investigative process, the old method, and maybe that's this is a method that's currently be used by your organization, but it's really taking a significant amount of financial records and looking at them and documenting them somehow, some way, whether it's in Word, Excel, or whatnot, maybe it's manually being done. Well, that is the old method. Let's go to the next slide, please. Then the new method is using leveraging technologies, right? There's plenty of data extraction uh, softwares out there to extract data from bank records, credit card statements, and other sources of information. And so that cuts out a lot of that manual uh, labor. And that's why Doug stressed earlier about getting electronic records to the extent you're poss that, that is possible because we can leverage this type of technology to reduce the amount of man hours or manual hours that we need to put into a matter. We start investigating versus just documenting. Next slide. 
And so really forensic accounting is really to hopefully uh, make those more complex financial exploitation investigations a little more clear uh, by, by really summarizing the financial transactions and telling a story as to what they represent in a meaningful manner. So taking 10,000 transactions and breaking it down into something that can be essentially identified or documented within a page in a table, chart, you name it, so that anyone can understand from a high level perspective, what took place, what transpired, and is there any evidence to refute or support allegation of exploitation? Next slide. The process, whether it's uh, us as forensic accounts or any other forensic accounts, you know, we'd strongly encourage you to reach out to forensic account to talk about an, an initial matter, uh, maybe have them perform a cursory view of the financial records. Uh, from there, you can identify the, the procedures to be performed. Uh, if, if the forensic accountants engage, they perform those procedures, they report back to your agency and talk about what, it, what they observed from the initial review of those records, what additional records may, may be needed, uh, and it's kind of a back and forth process uh, regarding receipt of records and examining, and then eventually documenting those, those findings in some fashion and reporting it back to APS. And really, it's an it's a, it's a evolution of a process, a lot of communication between the forensic account, the APS, and hopefully law enforcement and the prosecutor as well. Uh, next slide. Where to begin? Uh, you know, I know uh, financial transactions, complex matters, sometimes can be daunting because you have a, a, you know, a pile of records on your desk. But again, that's where forensic accounts can come in and, and help make it a little bit easier process. And hopefully you can leverage not only their, their abilities from a forensic accounting perspective, but maybe leverage some of the technologies that they have at their fingertips to make it a more um, efficient process when it comes to documenting transactions. Next slide. As, as Doug mentioned earlier, it's all about the totality of circ circumstances. Oftentimes, uh, you know, it, you, it might not be as simple as just one transaction or two transactions or 10 transactions, but maybe to look at 10,000. And so that's where we build that totality of circumstances by documenting the transactions and then summarizing. Next slide. And so just a quick example, here's a spreadsheet that we're all accustomed to documenting everyday bank transactions. Next slide. But wouldn't it be more meaningful if we took those transactions and broke them out to what are suspect transactions versus what are not, right? And this is a very simplistic chart, but I think it illustrates what transpired with these financial transactions from a spreadsheet that has 10,000 transactions. What, what are those transactions are suspect and which ones are everyday recurring appear to be for the benefit of the client, right? And so again, just a way to make it more meaningful for the everyday user to understand. Next slide. Again, breaking out to the, by potentially category or type of transactions, that can be done as well. Next slide. And again, you know, our time here today was short, but hopefully we've talked about how we can identify the assets through a variety of methods, uh, the financial records that you probably typically look at and other ways in which to look at them from a different perspective and maybe find additional assets or other accounts to look for. Then you really do have to start docking those transactions to follow the money. And again, if it's more complex matter involving several accounts over several years, you may, that's probably the time to involve a forensic account because it's probably gonna take more time and effort than a, than a typical case. Uh, especially if it involves maybe a person of interest that may have a side business and things of that nature. So you have a lot of transactions going in and out. And then ultimately we need to summarize our investigation by preparing written reports, narratives, work papers, and the original source documents to support our findings, right? And so forensic accounts really are here to assist you with those more complex financial investigations from a variety of uh, degrees, right? From just consulting on the front end, all the way through to writing reports that are comprehensive in nature that can be really leveraged and utilized uh, when you know, APS is wrapping up their investigation. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Next slide. Uh, regarding financial exploitation and forensic accounting, a, a tool for exploitation investigations. Doug and I really appreciate you attending our webinar today. And uh, if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you so much, Jason and Doug and the TARC team um, behind the scenes. And thank you all for um, for joining us. And, and this is really, really, really such great information. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, can we skip ahead to our last slide, um, Andy? Um, 
Go ahead and pop those questions in. We don't have time today. Um, you can also contact uh, Jason or Doug directly, um, but I do want to remind you that this is part one of a two-part webinar series we are doing on forensic accounting for ACL APS formula grant recipients. And um, let's go ahead and go to the last slide. Um, and our next webinar, Forensic Accounting APS Program Panel Discussion, is on November 16th at 3 p.m. Eastern. And an announcement went out to the ACL Formula Grant Listserv on October 8th. And I'll be sending a registration reminder early next week um, if you are interested in um, joining us for that. Um, please, you know, let us know if, if you're not, if you don't have access to the um, ACL Formula Grant Listserv. Uh, we'd be happy to have you join um, uh, us and your APS colleagues from four different states and counties. And it's going to be a panel discussion on how and why they've integrated forensic accounting, accountant, accountants or tools into their APS programs and some of the case outcomes. Um, so it's going to be um, APS programs talking about um, this very subject in a more in a in a very practical way. And thank you all for for submitting your answers to the questions. I'm actually going to download those and we will utilize those in part two. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and wish you adieu and hopefully see you uh, back here on November 16th. And if you have any questions, please do send them our way and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.